please join me in the call to worship. Let us thank the Lord for his wonderful works. God's steadfast love endures forever. God satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. God's steadfast love endures forever. God redeems us from trouble and gathers us here to worship. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn, number 310, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. The triune God mercifully and graciously invites us into a relationship of wholeness. In humility and truth, let us confess the sin that keeps us from the life God intends. Let us pray. Extravagant God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you offer riches that no earthly pleasures can match. You pour out mercy and cover us with love. You show us true justice and offer us peace. You provide us with every need and promise us eternal life with you. Yet we persist in seeking after that which robs us of abundant life. We hold fast to our anxieties and give in to our selfish wants. We desire the very things that harm us. Forgive our waywardness and lead us back to you. Purify us and sustain us by the strength and guidance of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God will pour out the Spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of power and grace, 
Fill us with the wisdom of your word and the understanding of your spirit so that we may be your church, a people with dreams and visions at work in all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 16 through 23. Listen for the word of God. Jesus told them a parable. A certain rich man's land produced a bountiful crop. He said to himself, what will I do? I have no place to store my harvest. Then he thought, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's where I'll store all my grain and goods. I'll say to myself, you have stored up plenty of goods, enough for several years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, fool, you, tonight you will die. Now who will get the things you have prepared for yourself? This is the way it will be for those who hoard things for themselves and aren't rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. There is more to life than food, and more to the body than clothing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is our time with young disciples. I uh, actually had something else in mind. And I forgot we were doing Jesus Loves Me. I wish my wife were here because she knows this better than I do. Did you, all learn the, did you learn the sign language version of that? Oh, okay. Come on up. <laughs> you can show everybody. You can, I'll try and I'm not going to get this right. But. All right. Yeah, I should have had should have had half the choir doing this. Well, we're, okay, so is it? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible, tell. Oh, wow! You got the whole tell ones. <laughs> hmm? Strong. Okay. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. That is wonderful. Thank you. I think that's an important message. All the kids need to know, and I'm glad. In fact, um, the great theologian Karl Barth who's written books and books and books of theology, was asked, how would you summarize the Bible? And that was his answer. Jesus loves me, this I know. This week, I'm going to be starting a five-week preaching series on what is called the five festive, 
festival or festal scrolls. They are five books of the Bible that our Jewish sisters and brothers kind of group together because each one of them is read at a different festival during the uh, year. The, the uh, Jewish name for them, and the Hebrew name for them is the Megilot, which means five scrolls. And what uh, we're going to do is look at a different scroll each one of the weeks. There are books of the Bible that maybe we don't spend as much time on, maybe almost no time on. And so this is a chance to uh, explore them and uh, not only to understand why they are used for, for the particular festivals, but how they can relate to our lives as well. And so this week we're going to start with the book of Ecclesiastes. Now last week we recognized several significant milestones in the lives of our children and youth. We baptized an infant and a youth. We confirmed three youths as full members of our congregation. And we celebrated high school graduates. One common thread in these events is that we as a congregation made and kept promises to help the parents raise their children in the faith. Now I'll tell you that as a parent, Nancy and I both, were so thankful for the extended church family who helped teach our sons about God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But they also helped teach them some practical advice. Things like, you know, work hard, but don't forget to stop and smell the roses. Care for others, but don't forget to care for yourselves as well. Eat properly. Exercise regularly. Get lots of sleep. And as they were heading off to college, don't forget to write your mom. All good advice for life. And frankly, most of it, except for that last one, is not actually that original. You can find it or hear about it one form or another in the Bible. One of the favorite places to go for this kind of advice is the book of Proverbs. There is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 5. A child who gathers in summer is prudent, but a child who sleeps in harvest brings shame. It's for all the farmers out there. And then there's Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We call this wisdom literature, practical advice for life that helps give us structure in an otherwise chaotic world. But when it comes to wisdom literature in the Bible, there are two caveats at least. First, this wisdom is not about how to get God to love us. We can't earn God's love even by trying to be extra good. We'll fail at it. As children of God, we are already loved. That's grace, unearned. When we baptized Hudson and Braden, the congregation acknowledged God's love for them and for all of us and about God's claim on our whole lives. But wisdom in the Bible is a reminder that God cares about us and provides us with rules to help us live better lives, to flourish. Now, a second caveat is that this wisdom offers, offers advice which is good only about 80, maybe 90% of the time. Pareto's law, which we know better as the 80-20 rule, applies to biblical wisdom too. Most of the time, the advice you receive will serve you well, but sometimes it won't. And you may have already experienced it. You work hard at your job or you work hard on a school assignment and the promotion or the recognition or the big raise goes to somebody else who worked on it. Or there's the woman who is a wonderful, caring person and then gets a cancer diagnosis and dies at a young age. Or the family driving home from a school awards night that is struck head on by a drunk driver and are killed while the 
drunk driver comes away with barely a scratch. And of course, then there are the mass shootings that we had at the grocery in a church and a school and a hospital. And we wonder, where is God's mercy and love? Where is God's justice? What happened to right and wrong, choosing God's way of life rather than choosing the way of death? It turns out the writers of the wisdom literature in the Bible struggled with these questions too, and they do not all speak with one voice. Some found the advice in the book of Proverbs to be just a little bit too simple-minded. One of the alternative voices in the Bible is the writer of Ecclesiastes. You may not be too familiar with the book, but if you grew up in the 60s, you knew a few verses from chapter 3, the one that was turned into a hit song by the birds. Now, listen as we hear the word of God from the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, most, I think, is in the bulletin. I may stop before the last verse. Yeah, I guess I could do that too. But it's from chapter 1 and from chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes. Listen for the word of God. The words of Koheleth, the teacher of the assembly, David's son, king in Jerusalem. Perfectly pointless, says the teacher. Perfectly pointless. Everything is pointless. What do people gain from all the hard work that they work so hard at under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains as it always has. The sun rises, the sun sets. It returns panting to the place where it dawns. The wind blows to the south, goes around to the north. Around and around blows the wind. The wind returns to its rounds again. All streams flow to the sea, but the sea is never full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they continue to flow. All words are tiring. No one is able to speak. The eye isn't satisfied with seeing, neither is the ear filled up by hearing. Whatever has happened, that's what will happen again. Whatever has occurred, that's what will occur again. There's nothing new under the sun. People may say about something, look at this, it's new. But it was already around for ages before us. There's no remembrance of things in the past, nor of things to come in the future. Nor will there be any remembrance among those who come along in the future. And then jumping to verse three, or chapter 3. There is a season for everything, and a time for every matter under the heavens. A time for giving birth, and a time for dying. A time for planting, and a time for uprooting what was planted. A time for killing, and a time for healing. A time for tearing down, and a time for building up. A time for crying, and a time for laughing. A time for mourning and a time for dancing. A time for throwing stones and a time for gathering stones. A time for embracing and, and a time for um, avoiding embraces. A time for searching and a time for losing. A time for keeping and a time for throwing away. A time for tearing and a time for repairing. A time for keeping silent and a time for speaking, a time for loving and a time for hating, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from all their hard work? I have observed the task that God has given human beings. God has made everything fitting in its time, but has also placed eternity in their hearts without enabling them to discover what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there's nothing better for them but to enjoy themselves and to do what's good while they live. Moreover, this is the gift of God, that all people should eat, drink, and enjoy the results of their hard work. 
I know that whatever God does will last forever. It's impossible to add to it or take away from it. God has done this so that people are reverent before him. Whatever happens has already happened, when whatever will happen has already happened before, and God looks after what is driven away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, that was a real cheerful reading, wasn't it? But there's some really sobering advice there. It may be an ancient text, but some of this could have been written just last week. The boredom of everyday tasks, the disappointment of having our hard work undone by the next person who comes along, the anger of someone else getting the credit for our work, the questions about why things happen to good people. Some of us may be toiling under the sun. Some of us may be toiling under the glow of our computer screens. Koheleth, the teacher, has lived a long life. He has seen it all. He has been successful. But throughout his life, he has been on a search for meaning. He has been asking questions that all of us ask at one time or another. Am I really happier? Have I really made a difference? What has my life added up to? And he comes to the conclusion that all this hard work is pointless. Wow. He's tried one philosophy after another. Each works for a little while. Then it turns out to be empty. That Hebrew word there is hebel. It's been translated as vanity. Maybe you're more familiar with the expression that's usually in the translation of this. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. But it's not the way we think of vanity. Probably the better translation is vapor or smoke or perhaps fleeting. Think of your breath on an icy cold morning. You breathe it out and see it for a few moments and then you see it no more. Or maybe think of fireworks. When they explode, we all say, ooh, and ah, and then after a few seconds, they're gone. Yes, the message of Ecclesiastes is tough, but it is also full of some truth. Maybe we want to close our eyes or plug our ears so we don't have to face or hear about the difficulties in life. Maybe we only want to think of the good times. But what God knows we really need is truthfulness. Ecclesiastes is telling the truth about our own limitations. We discover that there are times when the good and the bad in our lives are beyond our control. Not a welcome situation, but the truth. We struggle to understand why bad things happen to good people and why good things happen to bad people. Where is God in all this? Why did God allow this to happen? And the answer from Koheleth is that we can't know God. God is inscrutable. So stop trying to figure it all out. You're just wasting your time while life happens. One response to the truth should be humility before God. God has done this so that people are in awe of him. Koheleth writes. The book of Ecclesiastes is read every year during the Jewish festival of Sukkot, which occurs in the fall. This is a harvest festival that also commemorates the journey of the people of Israel through the wilderness, from Egypt all the way for, from, for 40 years to the Promised Land. Families build something called a sukkah in their backyard, and they still do that today. There are booths made from wooden poles with branches for covering. And they try to spend at least one night, maybe more, sleeping outside in them, just as their ancestors did in the wilderness. The branches that make up the roof of the booth are supposed to have at least a few openings so that you can see the stars at night. And so while you're sleeping out there, you have a reminder of the vastness of creation and the majesty of God. 
but also a reminder of our mortality and our frailty in the presence of God. But it is, should also be a reminder of a God who nevertheless cares for us and loves us. In the wilderness, when the people were hungry and complained, as they did constantly, God provided manna and quail for them to eat. And when the people were thirsty and they complained again, God provided them with water. And this is part of the good news Koheleth shares. Even in the difficult times, God meets us in these moments of despair, providing us with basic necessary gifts that we are prone to overlook. Maybe it is food and water. Maybe it's the comfort of a good friend. And as a reminder, just as the good times are fleeting, so the hard times are not permanent either. Life is a series of cycles. And I read that part in the third chapter, you know, the one that was made into the song, to everything turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time to every purpose under heaven. I suspect all of you who are farmers maybe get Koheleth better than the rest of us. Because every spring you prepare the ground and you plant the seeds. You weed and you prune and you fertilize. But for the most part you're at the mercy of the weather. In the fall you hope for a good harvest. And sometimes the weather cooperates and you have a bounty. And sometimes it doesn't. And then you start the whole cycle over again the next year. There is more good news here, hard to believe. But God is present in the ordinary cycles of our lives. The smaller gifts from God can be found in the normal moments of everyday life. Kohelet reminds us that this is the gift of God, that all people should eat and drink and enjoy the results of their hard work. I think Oheleth was a Presbyterian, loves to eat and drink and to work hard. But we should do that work enjoyably. Don't just use your talents, enjoy your talents. It is the truth that Koheleth shares that we acknowledge when we gather for communion with just even that little bit of bread and juice, a reminder of God's pr providence. And it's gonna be something we'll enjoy later when we have our picnic. Now, I need to qualify one thing about Koheleth. In some of this, you might get the impression that we're supposed to just accept the way things are, that this is our lot in life. No. Thank you. We need to work for fairness and for justice, for mercy and for love. But he reminds us not to be so driven that we don't stop to appreciate the things that God has given us. I think maybe the poet Mary Oliver beautifully captures this at the end of one of her poems called The Summer Day. In that poem, she is reflecting on creation and her, particularly on the little grasshopper she's been watching in the grass. And she ends with these words. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Question to leave with you all this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, this time we're going to receive two new members. Boy, we've had two great weeks in a row. This is fabulous. So at this time, I'd like to ask... Uh, Ryan Arnold and Alicia Williams and our clerk of session Don Baker to please come up front. So we're gonna have to share one. I, I didn't think about it. I should probably have had more multi microphones, but anyway, okay. Thank you. Okay. 
you would like to go right ahead and okay. start us off. <clears throat> On behalf of the session, I present Ryan Arnold and Alicia Williams, who have been received into the membership of this congregation by reaffirmation of faith. In baptism, you were claimed by God, marked as Christ's own forever, and joined to his body by the Holy Spirit. You come to us then not as strangers, but as friends in Christ and members of the household of God. We rejoice that you now desire to join with this congregation in the worship and mission of the church. Hear these words from scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. I have some questions for you. It's okay, I'll give you the answers. <laughs> Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? I do. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ is my Lord, Lord and Savior. Savior. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will, with God's help. As members of the body of Christ, let us affirm the faith into which we were baptized. So I invite you now to please stand in body or in spirit. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Alicia and Ryan, we, we have professed our faith as one body. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and mission through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I will, I will with God's help. Holy God, thank you for calling us to be your people and joining us to Christ's body, the church. We praise you for leading Ryan and Alicia to this congregation. Empower us by your spirit that we might love one another as Christ loved us, honoring him in all that we say and do, giving our lives in service to others through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Alicia and Ryan, remember your baptism and be thankful and know that the Holy Spirit is at work within you. Thanks be to God. Alicia and Ryan, welcome to this ministry that we share in Jesus Christ. We have some gifts for you here. You wanna, um, I think, put their names in the corner. A certificate a cer and a certificate and then I put their name on the inside just to make sure I get the name right yeah they're getting a copy of the Presbyterian handbook it is it is everything you need to know to be a Presbyterian <laughs> but congratulations Thank you. well friends let us turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer God of heaven and earth, in your wisdom you made the whole creation and called it good. You have lavished your creatures with beauty and sustained us with your grace. Even so, we are distracted. 
and create problems in the world you made. Humbly, then, we pray to you for comfort and healing and peace, saying, Gracious God, hear our prayer. For those who declare war, those who wage it, and those who suffer from it, gracious God, hear our prayer. For your church, that we may overcome divisions and live in the unity given to us in Christ, gracious God, hear our prayers. For your creation, that the earth's wounds may be healed and we may become better caretakers, gracious God, hear our prayers. For those who fight despair, struggle with addiction, or live without hope, gracious God, hear our prayers. For those who are ill and all who care for them, gracious God, hear our prayers. For those who grieve the loss of loved ones and friends, gracious God, hear our prayers. For the secret burdens of our hearts, gracious God, hear our prayers. All we have and all we are comes from you, O God, our creator, our sovereign. If we were to give thanks until the end of time, we could not repay your benevolence and grace. Take these offerings of our lives, that in everything we say and do, we might show forth your irrepressible love. Grateful for your mercy, we entrust these and all our prayers to you. And now as the body of Christ, hear us as we pray the way Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our last hymn, 683, Lord of all hopefulness, maybe less familiar words, but we'll be singing it to the tune of Be Thou My Vision. Be there at our sleeping and again. 
Friends, since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are of God, and to go forth to live lives worthy of your calling. As you go, may the God who gives us every good gift bless you and keep you in the mind of Christ by the power of the Spirit who sustains us all. And all God's people say, Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Also with you. Let us share that peace with one another and then enjoy a feast. <laughs>